Well, Chris set us up last week as he spoke from Acts chapter 4, and we're continuing into our series uh, through the book of Acts, and uh, it's good to see Terrell here this morning, visiting from Manning, him and his family, and good to have you with us this morning. Uh, So we're going to jump in. Uh, So Chris set us up last week, Acts chapter 4, talked about obedience, generosity, and talked about uh, what God desires in our lives of following after him. And it was, it was a challenging message about the importance of listening uh, for God's direction in our lives, about generosity, about how God wants to view uh, us to view the things that, that we have. Um, and if you missed it, you, you'll want to listen to it again. Uh, if you missed it, you can wa- listen to it online. Um, because I'm going to be jumping off of that for this week's message. Uh, and and I get to, he gets to talk about the fun stuff of generosity, and now I get to talk about the example of what happens in the other way. And he, he set us up, said, spoiler, people are going to die this week. Um, people are going to die in the text. Hopefully nobody's going to die here, uh, although it would be good for Chris's business if that happens, but, you know, we're... <laughs> That's a joke. That's... <laughs> Acts 5. Uh, it's the story of Ananias and Sapphira. So we're going to look at this text, and I, I'm going to bring out three things as we look through this text. We're going to talk about uh, unity through submission. We're going to talk about how deception and selfishness undermine the unity that God wants to bring in his church. And then we're looking at God's grace and his judgment. So let's, let's dig in. I want to go back to the text that Chris preached because it's, that text leads directly into this, and you need to understand the context. So Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 32 to 37. Miracles are happening in the church. Healings, salvations, people's lives are being transformed. Uh, God is at work in the early church. And then we, we see this. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. God's grace was so powerfully at work that there were no needy people. And so Chris talked about this idea of, of submitting to God's direction, that the things that he gives on our heart to, to help others and to bestow upon others, God's grace is so powerfully present in the early church that they didn't need the government to meet people's needs. They were doing it themselves. They didn't need a law of the land to dictate This is how you should take care of one another. God's grace was so powerful among them that they were just doing it of their own accord. So it continues, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. There, there's so many questions that I, I have in reading this text, that they were all of one heart and one mind. What does that mean? Like, because I've been a part of the church since I was a baby, and I have never witnessed in the church that everybody was of one heart and one mind. I've never seen it. I've, I've seen lots of fighting. I've seen lots of di- disagreements. In fact, so the, the joke, you know, in our household, um, my father would say, my father served on church board. My mother served on church board. And, you know, he would even say the church board is, is no place for a Christian man. <laughs> <laughs> There's just disagreements that happen. And we never see eye to eye. And so do you think that this actually meant that they agreed on everything in the early church? Because my, my understanding of people is the more people you get together, the more chance there is of disagreement over something. It's going to happen. And so I don't think it's that they saw everything the same. But I think the issue was, and this is exactly what Chris talked about last week, is they desired above anything else to see Jesus Christ elevated. 
above anything else, above their own welfare, above anything else, they wanted to see Jesus glorified. They wanted to see the kingdom of God brought into this earth. They wanted to see those things happen. And so maybe there was disagreements along the way. In fact, there will be disagreements along the way. We haven't got there yet, but it's going to happen here in the early church as well. But there was something definitely special happening in, in the early church in this moment, a special unity that they were experiencing from God's Holy Spirit. And it was evidence that God was at work among them because people don't live like that. I had a board member in my church that said everybody, he said, opinions are like armpits. Everybody has at least two of them and some stink worse than others. And that's what you get when you get people together. You get all sorts of differing opinions and differing ideas. But in the early church, God's grace was so powerfully at work that there was a unity that was happening among the early church. They had the same purpose, the same direction, the same focus. They all wanted to testify that Jesus was the Christ, that he had been raised from the dead, and that he was bringing salvation to whoever would seek him. And then it says that they were, they were selling fields, and they gave an example of this one guy named Joseph who sold a field that he owned, and he came and he laid the money at the apostles' feet. And it's interesting that he lays it at the apostles' feet, because this idea is, is one of submission, that he was bringing this, this money and laying it at the submission of the apostles' feet. And Jesus taught about money quite often throughout his teachings, but, but if, you, if you understand one thing, he's not actually talking about money. And this is, where we get, this is where we get off track. We think he's actually talking about money, but what he's talking about is a submission to him as Lord. And that usually shows up in our lives with how we handle our finances. That's the easiest, that's the low-hanging fruit of, of indication of what we do with our stuff. What Jesus is really pointing at and what we've really seen here in the early church is that it's about obedience, it's about trust, it's about being of one heart and of one mind. And Barnabas, when the Holy Spirit directs him to sell this field, he does. And he doesn't claim that the, the money is his own. He says it all belongs to God anyway. The field belonged to God in the beginning. And I'm just a steward of this, and so I'm, I'm laying it at the apostles' feet to distribute to those who have need as, as they see fit. And so he's put up as this example of, of this is what it is. But what's interesting here is that it's not a mandated socialism. It's not, it's not, it's not rules and laws that this is how we now had to live, that if you have stuff, you have to sell it, and it has to be distributed equally. It was genuinely God changing people's hearts and minds and how they viewed their own stuff. And Chris referenced in his message last week, asking God or obedience to God, he he used that phrase numerous times. It's never explicitly stated in the text, but we know from the larger testimony of Scripture and we know from our own experience that what was happening was God was leading people to do these things out of their own accord. They didn't need the law to tell them you need to look after each other. The Holy Spirit was saying, you need to look after each other. You need to take care of one another. And grace is seen in the supernatural unity and the willingness to not count anything that I own as what I own. It actually doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God, and I'm just stewarding it on his behalf. People have tried in different places at different times throughout history to mandate unity, to force, to force socialism, or, or what we see happening you know, is, is then a pushback of, well, we don't want socialism, we want democracy or capitalism or all these things, but, but God's not interested in the logistics of any of that. You see, God is interested in the individual and changing the heart, changing you from the inside out. Doesn't matter what the law of the land is, God wants you to be generous. God wants you to realize that everything you have doesn't really belong to you. You know, when you die, who's going to get it? (laughs) Probably the government. (laughs) When you die, you don't get to take it with you. And so Jesus even says, to store up treasure in heaven. 
Nobody was forced or mandated to do this. It was the Spirit that was doing this work in their lives. And what's interesting is you go back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 15, 4, one of the laws that God gave the people of Israel was to take care of the needy among you so that there would be no needy person, no poverty in, in Israel. They were to, there were actually laws in place for those who were poor so that they wouldn't starve, so that they would be looked after. God instituted a social welfare system among the people of Israel. And so what we see happening here is they didn't need the law to do this. They didn't need to come up with a new way to do it. They were just following the leading of the Holy Spirit as he was leading them and saying, I've, I've given you all these things. Do you need all of this or can you share it around? And they were following the Spirit. And then they lay it at the apostles' feet. And this is where we have trouble in our world today. And this is where we have issues in our own thinking. You see, we don't, we don't like this idea of submitting to someone else. We don't like the idea of, well, you know, how do I know they're going to do, do well with that? How do I know they're going to treat that the way that it should be treated? You know, this gift that I'm giving, can I really trust that, that that's going to be looked after well? And authority is a, is a problem because we need it. Without authority, the world just descends into chaos. And God has instituted divine authorities in place in this world. And it can be abused and it can be misused and we've seen evidence of that throughout history. When, there, when there's people that are placed in authority who should not be there, it gets really bad. And even people who are placed in authority who should be there, just it goes to their head and they start living for their own use and it becomes, it becomes a problem. But submission is still the biblical model. Even Jesus submitted to the Father's will in coming to earth, submitting to the cross, submitting to death, modeling submission for his church, that this is what it looks like. But it doesn't come from our own ability because we can't, we can't do that in our own strength. No, none of us in our own strength want to submit to somebody else because we don't trust anybody else. We only trust ourselves. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you shouldn't even trust yourself. You really shouldn't because we're easily deceived. We're easily led astray. We, we, we wander, we're prone to selfishness, we're prone to all of those things in and of ourselves as well. And so at some point, somewhere along the way, you have to trust something. And Jesus shows up saying, you can trust me. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And then he leads us into this life of submission. But it flows from God's work in us, not our own ability. Unity and generosity are the trademarks of the Spirit's work among his church. And so I would say, instead of looking for the powerful signs or the overt signs that we tend to look for in the Spirit's work in the church, people falling down or people speaking in tongues or all of those things, and none of those things are good, but ultimately, the true marks of the Spirit at work in the church are lasting fruit, unity, peace, self-control, humility, a willingness to lay down stuff, generosity, compassion. You see, because these things don't flow naturally in the human heart. There's resistances we have to all of that stuff in our own selves. And I know because I... I'm not the most compassionate person. I'm, I'm not the most generous person. My wife can testify if you don't believe me. It doesn't flow naturally in me. I need the Spirit's work in my life for these things to flow out. And so this is what's at work in the early church, but people be people. In Acts chapter 5, verse 1, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You've not lied just to human beings, but to God. And I just want to pause here for a moment. 
This story is not about money. This story is not about God needing our money. This story is about obedience, selfishness, and posturing to look better than you actually are. You see, Barnabas is placed forward as a prime example of what this looks like in a person's life. He had a field, he sold it, he brought all the money before the apostles. But then Ananias and Sapphira go and do a similar thing. The difference is they have a field, they sell it, and then they decide amongst themselves, we're going to hold back some of this money for ourselves, but we're going to bring it before the apostles as if it's the entire amount that we got for the field, because we want to be like Barnabas. We want to look good in front of people. Look how generous I am. Look how, look how unselfish I am. Look at how wonderful a follower of Jesus I actually am. The, and it becomes a show for him and for his wife. When Ananias heard this, verse 5, he fell down and died. Wow. Like instant, instantly dropped dead right there in that moment. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Yeah. <laughs> This guy goes to Peter and lays money at his feet, and Peter says he's lying to God that this, this isn't the, the money he received for the field, and then he died. Yeah, great fear. Then some young, young man came forward, wrapped up his body, carried him out, and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the man who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. How would you like to be a, a young person in that church? <laughs> You're the undertakers. Young Adult Ministry, August 11th. We're going to bury some dead people. <laughs> Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I got to be honest, I was not looking forward to preaching this this morning. I, I struggle with this story. And I struggle with this story for a couple of reasons. Number one, on the larger scheme of things, it seems so minor and insignificant what Ananias and Sapphira did in that moment. I mean, we look at the, the history of church. We look at what the church has done in Jesus' name sometimes. The crusades, the residential schools. How has God not showed up and struck more people dead? How is it that, that any of us, we talk about disunity. How is it that any one of us are still standing? Because I know what's at work in my heart. I know the disunity that I feel sometimes for people. How is it God hasn't struck me dead? But here he is, he strikes them dead. The other issue that I have with this story is this isn't some Old Testament story like back, way back and, you know, some prophet and shows up and, and some teenagers make fun of him and he calls out bears out of the woods and they maul him to death. True story. <laughs> that actually happened. This is, this is after Jesus has showed up, died for our sins, poured his grace upon the world, forgiven us of our sins, and then Ananias and Sapphira go and lie about some money and they drop dead. So what's, the, what's going on here? What's really happening in this moment? Why is it that they get struck dead over fudging the numbers of what they got? Because that's what they did. They were just fudging the numbers. We're, we're gonna, they were still generous. They still sold the land. They still gave a bunch of the money. 
But Peter points it out in verse 3. Peter, when he asks the question, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit? And this same phrase was used for Judas, that Satan had filled his heart that he betrayed Jesus in Luke 22.3. And interestingly with Judas, it was also for some silver. You've not lied to men but to God. And this idea that you have, and he says you've kept some of the money for yourself. The, the Greek word that he uses here basically means embezzled. It's only used one other time in all of Scripture. The other time we see it is Joshua chapter 7 for Achan. And the story with Achan was that the nation of Israel was sent in to destroy this other nation, and God says you cannot keep any of their possessions for your own. You're to destroy everything. You don't keep any of the possessions. Don't keep any of the livestock. Don't gain wealth from this nation. And they go in and they destroy the nation except for one guy, Achan, who sees some of the king's stuff and keeps it for his own and hides it in his tent. And the same word for what he did was used there. It basically means embezzlement. And embezzlement, the interesting idea with embezzlement, embezzlement is a special kind of theft. You see, embezzling is when you steal or misappropriate funds that have been placed in your trust. You know, it's usually used for people who run an organization or a company. They oversee all the funds of that company and that organization, and they do illegal things with it. They keep some of it. They, they use it for unlawful gain. And so the idea here in using this word, Peter is saying, the money's not yours. The money's been entrusted to you. It, it, you're the caretaker for these funds. You don't own them. They've been placed in your trust. No one claimed their possessions as their own, is what we saw in verse four, or chapter 4, verse 32. You see, if Ananias had, had decided that the land was his to do what he want, and, and he kept it, and he didn't sell it, and he didn't show up pretending to be giving all the money, I think he would have lived. I think he would have been fine. If Ananias had been mostly greedy but honest and say, yeah, I sold the land and this is half the money or this is 25% of the money and I'm keeping the rest of it for myself, I think he would have been fine. It was this idea that he shows up and pretends to be something that he's not. That he's lying to the Holy Spirit. He's basically saying to God, I'm more spiritual than I really am. And trying to convince the church that he was more spiritual than he really was. The sin wasn't in the money. It hadn't, it, it's not about the money. It's about the holding back of the truth and the posturing to show himself as something better than he was. Because what happens is, and this is what we see, deception, posturing, hypocrisy, whatever name you want to stick on it, it undermines the unity that God wants to bring about in his church. It, it's this idea of this selfish deceitfulness that I want to look better than I actually am. I want people to think I'm better than I actually am. Appearing to be one thing when you're really something else. And the, Jesus came down hard on this idea of hypocrisy among the religious leaders again and again and again. You're pretending to be more spiritual than you actually are. You know the word, but you're not living it out. You're expecting other people to live it out, but you ignore it. Jesus, these are the things that Jesus would say to the Pharisees and the religious leaders over and over. And now we see it creeping into the church, trying to be more spiritual than they actually were, hiding their sin instead of acknowledging it. And this is, this is, the, this is the thing that should scare us. When we, when we do not live openly and honestly before God, when, we, when we're trying to pretend we're more holy or more spiritual or more godly than we actually are, that should terrify us because that's what received the judgment of God in that moment. 
Instead of, instead of being honest and saying, you know what? I'm, I am selfish. I'm, I sold the land, but I want to keep 80% of it for myself and I'm going to give 20% of it. I think that's, that's okay. To say, you know what? I'm, I don't want to sell this land at all. I, I want to use it and I want to continue to make profits off it and I have plans for it for to give to my family. Okay. That's between you and God. But when you say, I'm very spiritual and I'm just as spiritual as Barnabas and I'm going to give the money from this land, even though I'm not really giving the money from this land, I'm just giving a portion of it. Instead of saying, I'm jealous of Barnabas, I want the attention that he got, I want, I want the pat on the back that he received, Ananias and Sapphira pretend to be something they're not. But here's the, here's the truth, church. We're all broken. We're all there. We're all broken people just trying to figure out how are we supposed to live this life? What are we supposed to do? Trying to hear the voice of God and understand what it is he's speaking to us. And we need to be honest about that. We need to be honest that, that we are, we're broken people, imperfect people, trying to follow God to the best of our ability, and we're gonna make mistakes. And stop the posturing. Stop pretending to be spiritual. Stop pretending to be more holy than you actually are. Because it's a dangerous place, and I'm not saying that in a critical way, I'm saying that to warn you because that's where the danger is. And that's what we're warned about constantly throughout Scripture is this idea of trying to make ourselves look like something we're not. And the interesting thing in this story is that, that it's all prefaced earlier with this statement that God's grace was powerfully at work in all of them. And, and this is where I struggle mostly in this story is that God's grace is at work, and yet Ananias and Sapphira drop dead in that moment. Where's grace for them? You see, we, we read about the grace that's at work, and they're meeting people's needs and doing all this stuff, and then they die at Peter's feet. How do we reconcile that? I mean, is there no grace for them? That's what, I, that's what I'm reading this, and I'm seeing this. And here's a further irony. The name Ananias means God is gracious. <laughs> it also could mean God gives. Irony. The irony of that. When we think of God's grace, you see, we think of, we think of his kindness, we think of, we think of the generosity of God toward us in giving us his son Jesus and forgiving our sins and in all the things that we look at in our lives that are good, we say, well, that's, that's an act of God's grace in our lives, all these good things, forgiving our rebellion, being patient with us in our foolishness, in our waywardness, not destroying us, all of those things. That's God's grace. And I gotta be honest, this sermon was mostly written on Wednesday. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and this morning, I'm wrestling with this last section of how does God's judgment line up with this idea of his grace? And I have so many thoughts, profound ideas, but I don't want you to be led astray by what I don't say. <laughs> I don't want you to hear things that I'm not saying the, because the enemy's gonna swoop in in this moment and he's gonna try to convince you things about God and not hearing the full picture of who God is. What if, what if in this moment, removing Ananias and Sapphira in the early church was an act of grace? Amen. What if God was actually saving the unity of the church by removing the people who were going to bring disunity in that moment? What if for Ananias and Sapphira, that God's judgment on them in that moment was actually better for them in the long run. Amen. Because I think about in our own lives and I, I look at some of the people that I, 
that, that I know, and I look at my own life, given over to our own devices, how far would we actually wander? How deep would we actually go from God, given over to our own devices, doing things our way the way we want to without God's intervention? Where would our lives end up? And some of you know, I've talked with you between addictions and, and, and other difficulties in your life that you bring about, not realizing that that's what you're doing, but running in rebellion from God. And the hurt and the heartache and the sorrow that it causes. You see, one thing we don't see here, we do not see that Ananias and Sapphira are cast into hell. We don't see that they're eternally judged. We don't see any of that stuff. We see in that moment they're dead. But if as the Christian church we believe that death is just the doorway into eternity, maybe them dying in that moment was the most gracious thing God could have done for them as well. Maybe it was. And I don't know because I'm not God. I don't see the bigger picture. But he does, and I trust him in that. You see, the reality is this. God's not done with you after you're dead. In fact, Jesus says, don't fear him who can kill the body, but fear him who, this is my paraphrase, fear him who's after done killing the body still isn't finished with you. We don't know what happens to Ananias and Sapphira. We, we may see them in heaven. It's, there's, it's just, there's, it's silent on that. What's interesting as I look at this and as I wrestle with this idea of God's judgment, you see, we picture God's grace and we picture his judgment as two separate things that cannot coexist in the same space. But we have to reconcile it because throughout the Old Testament, it does coexist in the same space. When the prophets of the Lord talked about, they talked about a very specific event. They talked about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction, Isaiah says. It's a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger. The day of the Lord is near, a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations, Ezekiel says. Joel says, he calls it the great and glorious day of the Lord. The great and glorious day of the Lord. Amos says, woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. You see, there's, there's this aspect of God's grace and his judgment at work together in this idea of the day of the Lord because the day of the Lord is the day when God will bring everything to completion, everything will be laid bare, every Ananias and Sapphira moment you've ever had will be laid bare before him and we will be judged accordingly. And his grace is available for all who have accepted Jesus for all who have turned to him and in faith believe that he is our salvation. And yet his judgment is present as well. And this is, this is clear as we read through Revelation, even throughout the New Testament. Peter talks about this day of the Lord. And what's interesting is in this moment, what we see is that because of God's mercy, his judgment has to be present. You see, a God who has no judgment, think of all the horrible things that have happened in our world over the last thousand years. If there's no judgment for any of that stuff, it makes no sense. It's just chaos. But it's because of his mercy that there, there will be judgment. And it's because of his judgment that we need his mercy. We need it because all of us will stand under judgment without God's mercy. All of us are worse than Ananias and Sapphira. And what's interesting in this moment is that we see the picture of the early church laying down their possessions at Peter's feet and then God strikes Ananias and Sapphira dead at Peter's feet. And Luke is not an idiot when he writes this. He knows exactly the imagery that he's trying to draw out. 
He is communicating very clearly that one way or another, we all will submit to the authority of Jesus, either willingly or unwillingly. It's going to happen. But Peter didn't bring the judgment. God brought judgment. Peter just pointed out what was actually happening, and then it was God who brought the judgment. And so this is a warning for Christians who go around just proclaiming judgment and doom all the time. You are not as holy as you think you are either. If Peter was reluctant to do that, just speaking exactly what he was given by the Holy Spirit, not proclaiming death and judgment, just saying you've lied to the Holy Spirit and to God, and then God does the judgment, do not place yourself in God's place. Be careful of that. Along with discipleship comes responsibility. If we want God to draw near in miracles and in healing and in unity and in times of refreshing in our lives, we want to be with him, we need to realize that We don't just get to pick the section of God that we get to be with, the fuzzy teddy bear God who cuddles us all the time. It's all of God. And so his presence doesn't draw near without also his holiness drawing near. And this is the fear that resulted in the early church. They were terrified. They were afraid of who God was and what he was. And I was trying to think, what story can best, and there's only one story that I could think of to communicate this clearly. And I go back to this idea of giving. So that you don't think that this is about giving money. This is, this, you've missed it. If, if you leave and money is the first thing you think of when you left this service, you've missed everything I've said. I had a board member in my first church and he was struggling financially. And he tells me this story. He was struggling financially and God spoke to him very clearly. I want you to give this amount of money for this specific need. And I want you to do this on a regular basis. And he's, I don't, know how, I don't know how I'm supposed to do this. And he wrestled with that. And then his wife also felt the same thing. And so they said, you know, God's got to be speaking to us. You know, you both, I have this number in mind and this is what it is and you have this number in mind and so this is what we're going to do. So they did. They committed to do that. And they said, God was faithful throughout that whole process. He said, we never... We never missed a bill payment. There was, always, there was always enough. And then about three years later, he gets a promotion. He gets a raise. He gets more money than he realized he was going to get. And he said he showed up to church that first Sunday after getting the raise, after getting all this stuff, and he had decided that he was going to double the amount that he was giving to this particular need. And he fills out his check and whatever and drops it in the bucket. And he said, as soon as he put it in the bucket and it went on, he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. What are you doing? Who told you to do that? And he said, well, well, God, I just want to give back from what you blessed me. You were so faithful my uh, my whole life. I just want to do this because this is what you, you know, this is what you blessed me with. So I want to do this. And God said to him, he said, when I told you to give that first number, was that your idea or was it mine? He said, well, it was yours. And this number, was that your idea or was it mine? It was me. And he said, in that moment, God spoke to me about an important thing. He said, it's not about generosity. It's about pride and selfishness. In my arrogance, 
I presume to think, because I can do this, I should do this. He said, now the, the irony and the funny thing of all this is, is God has led me in all sorts of giving ways that are way beyond anything that I thought in that moment. But in that moment, I was making it about me. And this is the lesson, and it's, it's so applicable to this moment of Ananias and Sapphira. It is not about you. It is not about your money. It's not about you looking good or feeling good or any of those things. It's about obedience to God. It's about submission to him because nothing will kill unity like the hubris and the pride and the arrogance that goes with thinking you're the one who's in control of these decisions. And nothing will build unity like submission to the direction of God in our lives to say, God, I don't know, but I'm gonna follow you. Whatever it is you have for me, whatever that looks like in my life, in every area of my life, I wanna be obedient to you. I wanna follow you. I don't wanna make the mistake Ananias and Sapphira made. I don't wanna make it about me. It's about you, it's about your kingdom, it's about your way, and I wanna walk in obedience to that. And that's what we're called to do. And that's the message of Ananias and Sapphira. That's the warning for the church, for you today. Is it about you or is it about our Heavenly Father? Is it about what you can do or is it about what He is going to do? Is it about what you have or is it about what He has? We need to live in submission to Him. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that your grace would be so abundant upon your church in this generation. Not just here at CFA, Lord, but every church that gathers and that calls you Lord. Jesus, that your grace would be evident in our lives, that unity would be the the trademark of your church, that a generous spirit would rise up in all of us. Lord, that it's, it's not about what we look like, it's about you being glorified. Jesus is not about our own posture and position of holiness, it's about you being glorified. And Lord, I pray that you would confront us in every way in our lives where we have elevated ourselves over you. We have elevated our desires over yours. We have elevated the things that we want over the things that you ask us to do. Lord, help us to walk in humility before you. Help us to walk in humility before one another. Lord, I pray for forgiveness for the times when we have not done that. Lord, that we would not suffer your judgment and wrath, but that your grace would be abundant as we repent of those things, as we bring those things into the light, as you are in the light. Lord, help us to walk humbly and honestly and openly before you and before one another. Lord, we don't want to pretend anymore. We want to be honest and truthful about our need for you, about our brokenness, about the areas of our lives where we don't have it figured out, where we are still messed up. Lord, we need your grace at work in our lives. Lord, for those who are outside of the faith, who have not accepted you as Lord and Savior Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would draw them by your Holy Spirit, that they would know that you are the answer for everything, that you are salvation and life Lord Jesus, I pray that uh, a grace and a compassion and a unity would build upon this church, especially upon the people who call CFA their home. Lord, that it would be a mark and a cornerstone of our church that people who would come here would say, yeah, this is a place where people care about one another, where there is a, a compassion and a grace at work. When we, are, when we are selfish, Lord, correct us, When we are wayward, Lord, bring us back. I pray, Lord, that this would be a work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed this morning. If you desire prayer, 
Uh, we'd love to pray with you, give you an opportunity to come and pray. Um, but go have a great weekend um, and be challenged to walk in his grace and realize that his judgment is also real as well. But it's because of his grace that there is judgment. Amen.